If you read Asus's own copy on this board from their website, it says, don't be fooled by its flyweight frame. The Strix B650EI packs walloping performance with a jacked VRM and pumped with both DDR and PCIe 5. Okay, that's enough. This VRM, it's jacked. Welcome to Chinese More. I don't know who comes up with that stuff, but yeah, that's uh, kind of entertaining, right? <laughs> We're continuing our look here at the Ryzen 7000 Mini ITX boards. We're getting down to our last tube. This one is the ASUS ROG Strix B650E ITX. The E designation sets this one apart from the vanilla B650 chipset. Uh, the primary difference here is that the X16 slot is PCIe Gen 5 and also one of your M.2 drives will be PCIe 5.0. Now, Gen 5 compatibility for the M.2 on a B650 chipset equipped board is optional. The MSI B650 ITX doesn't have support for that, while the Gigabyte one we looked at last week does support it. But on this board, the top M.2 under the heatsink is a Gen 5 one. You also have a Gen 4 compatible M.2 on the back of the board. This one is in an easy to access location. In cases like the NR200 or the NK M1, it's super easy to access this bottom one to add additional drives or upgrade your drives post build. Just pull that side panel. There's a cutout, you should be able to access that directly. So it's very nice to have this on the back. Let's talk about the layout first because that's the strongest feature of this board. Most ASUS boards have a similar layout and it's very convenient at the top. You have your three fan headers, your CPU, AIO, and your case fans. Next, you have your 5 volt and your 12 volt RGB headers. And next to that, this one is ARGB Gen 2 compatible. And you have a set of debug LEDs in the corner over here. That's very nice. Moving on down the right side, then you have your 24 pin connector. Okay. Then you have a USB 2.0 connector, a set of uh, two SATA data connectors. 3.2 Gen 2 USB-C front panel connector, USB 3.2 front panel connector, a set of regular uh, front panel connections. You got a power button, reset button, HD LED, and a power button LED connector. So very nice, right? Breath of fresh air coming off the Gigabyte board. These two right here, the top one is a temperature sensor, so you can hook up a temp probe. Love it. A very useful for an open loop build. And the one directly under it is the clear CMOS jumper. So there is a complaint here. When you are built up, sometimes the spot just under that 24 pin connector, anywhere under here, it's really tight and it's hard to access. Okay, this clear CMOS header might take a little work to get to still, but at least it's better than the one on the Gigabyte, I think. Right above your X16 expansion slot is your Gen 5 M.2 assembly. Two screws hold down this heatsink. This has been the toolless mount that ASUS has been doing lately. It's very convenient. It's uh, just toggle it with your thumb, and then you got that there. There is a, you can have a thermal pad underneath, and you can have a thermal pad um, over it. With the top metal piece, there's a thermal pad that connects these two, uh, your M.2 drive and the heatsink piece thermally. So this is gonna do the bulk of the M.2 cooling for you. The M.2 heatsink, it's low and there's no board to board connectors here. This is just strictly a piece of metal. Its compatibility with low profile and tower coolers will be good as a result. You won't have any issues with most liquid cooler CPU blocks either. In the bottom left corner is your front panel audio connector. So you notice anything? There's no add-on cards, no dongles, no funny tunneling under components to get to headers. It's all very straightforward. And that makes this a very good board choice for a first time builder or a seasoned builder alike. I think you can all appreciate how logical this is laid out. You do have a VRM fan underneath this mesh cover on the top right uh, within the rear IO heatsink assembly. This one blows air at the VRM heatsink. So I didn't see a way to control that in BIOS based on my testing, it stays off and comes on when the VRM temp sensor hits 60 degrees. If you have good airflow in this area, such as from a top-down cooler setup, perhaps you have a side panel or an AIO fan that's encouraging airflow in this area, you might not really need that fan. Uh, that fan may not come on too much to begin with, but you can take it off if you want. The noise from the fan was not bad though, since most likely your VRM temps won't hit that uh, type of uh, temperature level until the system is fully loaded. 
At that point, you'll have your CPU cooler fan on pretty strong, and at that point, it's hard to pick out the sound of the little fan over the rest of the system. But really, if it does bother you, you can remove the fan or unplug it. You'll just unscrew the back plate, the, the rear I.O. shield, sorry, and um, take off this plastic cover here. Four screws. Then you can just unplug the fan from that header right there. Take it off and just I just make sure you have good airflow in the area. Test and monitor that VRM temp before you uh, put deploy it full time. Okay, build quality is good, but not great. This PCB, it doesn't feel cheap. Uh, you have a rear IO shield here that's integrated. It's very nice. Uh, no backplate though, unlike the Gigabyte B650 ITX, but some of these headers, they have a little bit sloppy soldering here. Uh, for example, that uh, temp probe in the CMOS header, it's a little sloppy there. But other than that, it's its mostly okay. Moving on to the IO, at the back you have uh, four type A, 3.2 Gen 2 ports. Then you have two USB 2.0 uh, type A ports. One of them is labeled BIOS for BIOS flashback, so it does have that capability. Uh, you have two type C ports, one labeled 20 is a 3.22 by 2 so 20 gigabits per second the other one is uh, 10 gigabits per second audio connectors are great you got a line in line out mic and an optical port here so if you're connecting to uh, an av receiver or a separate amplifier this is very convenient so fully featured audio the codec is also very good with this one as well it's a top tier Realtek ALC 4080, and that is paired with a Savvy Tech amp. It sounds good. Surprisingly, it was able to drive my Hi-Fi Man planar magnetics. It did require 100% volume, and it couldn't go any louder at that point, but surprisingly, it sounded pretty good for an onboard audio solution. Um, in terms of motherboard audio, this is gonna be one of your higher end combos, I think. Uh, of course, a detached DAC and amp, it's still gonna be better since it avoids interference from your other electronics in the build, namely your GPU. But yeah, they chose to implement a very solid audio setup here. So there is no display port for your integrated graphics. You have the HDMI port, but it's usually not a big deal if you're running a graphics card. 2.5G Ethernet, and you have Wi-Fi 6E. So there's a problem with this one. This is a MediaTek one, and they probably should have gone with an Intel one here uh, for how much this board is. A little cost cutting, I think. If you do have a Wi-Fi 6 router and it's not connecting to it consistently, then that might be your culprit. So personally, I think the Intel one is a safer bet, but yeah, you know, it is what it is. Final thing worth mentioning here is this flex key. Out of the box, it's set up as a reset button, but you can also set it up to toggle your Aura LEDs or some other uh, functions such as Safe Boot if you want. But it's a nice to have feature if your case doesn't have a reset button and you know, plenty of ITX builds don't have a reset button. So this can be nice, uh, but you might, you know, feel the BIOS flashback button instead, uh, but just you know, realize that it's the shorter button here. So about that jacked VRM? Well, I mean, it's definitely adequate, but I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's jacked, you know? Uh, 10 plus two, 70 amp stages here. So if you consider what's available for the CPU is just a step above the MSI, which has 880 amp stages for the CPU and the rest of the Ryzen 7000 mini ITX lineup, it's gonna be better than either of these two boards. But at the end of the day, you'll be fine running any Ryzen 7000 CPU on PBO anyway. So, you know, we're horses for courses, right? Two DDR5 slots here, 64 gigs max. If you are on the latest BIOS, you should be able to have 48 per stick uh, for a max of 96. Um, in the latest BIOS, there's also a few Expo or ASUS's DOCP profiles. In fact, with this kit, there was a DOCP tweaked profile and that's supposed to be better, further refined, but it actually gave me a worse memory mark score than the DOCP one setting. So you may wanna try things out and see what works better. Startup time, post time on this board is not bad at all. Past the initial memory training, the post times were all within 15 seconds to get to the ASUS logo. And that's very, very competitive and it's faster than ASUS's high-end X670E ITX board. Performance-wise, this is in line with the other boards that I've tested with the 7700X. 
At stock, PBO is giving the CPU 125 watts PPT uh, sustained for continued multi-core renders. And the in the long run, it's settled in at 5150 megahertz across all cores. The VRM temps, totally fine, coming in the low 60s. And that's the threshold of where the fan comes on and those temps are perfectly fine for VRMs uh, for an you know, extended period of time. With a minus 25 all core offset and allowing the system to push the core clocks higher, the average clocks came out closer to 5300 megahertz which is fairly in line with the performance I've experienced with this CPU. And with gaming, it was getting 5.5 gigahertz single core boosts very consistently. I didn't experience any coil line on this board, although I have seen some user feedback that there's had it. So do be careful if you are sensitive to that, try it out first. If not good, switch it out. Um, but otherwise all good with the performance testing. I did also test the BIOS flashback function. No problems there. Very convenient too, for the board to have that function. So there's very little to dislike about this board. The layout is king. You have good IO, temp probe header, which isn't on any other board except the X670E ITX. Good onboard audio. You have a low M.2 heatsink for a good compatibility. Gen 5 compatibility on both the X16 and the M.2. You know, however useful you find that right now or in the near future. But you know, this board pretty much checks off all the boxes except the one I haven't talked about yet. And that's because this board is pretty dang expensive. It's the second most expensive Ryzen 7000 ITX board right now, and it's topped only by ASUS's X670E ITX board. Most retailers have this at $325 US right now. That ASRock B650E ITX is the most direct comparison uh, with the same chipset, coming in around $290 right now. Uh, I'm reviewing that one next, but uh, that's a $35 difference, which is a lot. I do wish they positioned this board with the B650 chipset, which would make it more on the value end of the spectrum. And that would have been a little bit more distance, more differentiation from their X670 EITX board, which actually, you know, for all the things that matter, this is a better board and I would go for this one over that one and it's cheaper too, right? But as it stands compared to the MSI B650i, it's about $50 more. Is it worth it? Well, at the end of the day, it depends on how much you value the PCIe Gen 5 compatibility and the more expanded IO options. For most users, the Gen 5 compatibility will really be more for bragging rights at this point, but I think you could definitely make a cost argument for the expanded rear IO and the better audio here, if that's what you're looking for. If you don't need that, I think the MSI is a very solid board as well. And then if it's a gaming build with a chip like the 7600X, I would lean in that direction. If it's audio you care about, you could spend the difference on an external DAC, which is something you can move from this build to the next and so on and so forth, and it'll give you better results anyway. So that will do it for this review. The ASRock B650E uh, is coming up next, and then I'll do a final roundup for Ryzen 7000 ITX at this point. Hope you enjoyed this review and found it helpful. If so, please subscribe if you haven't already. It really helps, so please go ahead and do that if you haven't. Also give a like, and uh, links are down below. Thanks for watching.